Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul qutam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Inshallah today I wanted to actually reflect on um, a verse in a different surah. Uh, and this is Surah Al-Taqabun. It's something that we, um, the tafsir of this verse was something that was very striking, uh, I think, for uh, for me this week. I, I teach a weekly tafsir class, alhamdulillah, and so this verse was really an important lesson. And I wanted to, an opportunity actually to expand more on just one statement, one comment mentioned by one mufassir on a clause of the of this verse. And it's in Surah at taghabun verse 11. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَا يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ so that's the entirety of the verse that whatever uh, befalls a person from a musibah from an affliction it is only by the permission of God and that whoever believes in Allah then Allah guides their heart and Allah is over all things knowing so this is the verse the clause that I want us to look at is um, يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَ Right, so whoever believes in Allah, then Allah guides their heart. Now, um, in the tafsir of what guidance means in this context, I was expecting to read uh, different uh, different comments, different tafsir. I thought that guidance is going to talk about people who um, they're guided because they do all of the uh, acts of obedience and they stay away from all of the acts of disobedience. And while that's included in what was mentioned, uh, something else was mentioned as sort of like the primary running theme about what guidance means in this context. And subhanAllah, we can never take even, you know, clauses of the Quran are repeated uh, a number of times, but depending on the verse and depending on the context of those verses, it includes different shades of meaning. So in this particular clause, وَمَا يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبًا Because what comes before it is about whoever is afflicted with a difficulty, then it is only by the permission of God. So now this, the meanings that arrive from, from uh, this clause right after it are going to be affected by what comes before. And so Imam Ibn Ajiba, he says that Allah guides his heart means that Allah guides the heart to contentment and surrender with the divine decree. That's what guidance of the heart means. It's surrender and contentment with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed uh, upon us, which has already befallen. And he also says that it, because he, he includes many meanings, and he says it's the realization of returning to Allah, that these are people who would say or believe in a time of difficulty, right? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That truly to Allah we belong and to Him we return. So the guidance of the heart here is again going back to a theme of contentment and surrender and acceptance of that which comes to us from God. We know that these are words that we would say in, in a time of tragedy, right? In a time of difficulty, when we lose a loved one, these are the words that we say. So again, here the guidance of the heart is that acceptance of what God has um, allowed to occur towards us in uh, in the world itself. Mujahid, who is a mufassir from the Tabi'in, he said something that I think this is what what's going to be kind of our focus, inshallah, for today. He said about this verse that the guidance of the heart means if they are tested, they are patient. And if they are given, they are grateful. And if they are transgressed, they forgive. That's what the guidance of the heart is. And so we're gonna reflect on each piece, that if they are tested, they are patient. And if they are um, given and they are you know, blessed by, by, by something that they enjoy, then they're grateful. And then if they are transgressed, they're, they're able to forgive or that they forgive. This also, each one of these parts is connected to contentment and acceptance of the divine decree. Ibn Atiyah, who's a Mufassir and a Maliki scholar and who was a judge uh, in Andalusia, uh, he's also a Mufassir, he said, the one 
the the that Allah guides their heart means the one who acknowledges and recognizes the divine decree, then their trials are made easier for them and lighter for them. So the guidance of the heart is again connected to acceptance. It's connected to contentment with God Himself. And then their difficulties and what they're going through uh, is not as bad. And 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 there's a burden that's lifted because an aspect of the burden that's lifted because their hearts were able to get to this point. And so contentment and um, acceptance and loving surrender, as we kind of talked about earlier, it's connected to patience itself. So one of the things that Imam Ibn Ajiba talks about when he talks about contentment and submission, uh, in Arabic it's ar-rida wa taslim, he says that for both contentment and submission, the beginning is patience. The beginning of contentment and loving surrender is patience and spiritual effort. So what this means is that something happens that is hard for us. Maybe we don't like it. Maybe it's not easy. And in order to, um, to practice our faith in a way that's pleasing to God in that with whatever that is, we have to have spiritual effort and we have to practice patience. So that's how contentment and uh, surrender start. It starts from a place of that personal struggle. The middle of it, again, this is the higher level of the striving, is actually peace. That things are not going to be as difficult because the level of contentment with God has increased. The level of surrender with God has increased. So, um, so they will have they will not have to practice as much patience. They will simply have peace in their hearts. They will have already a sense of surrender. And he says, even while some thoughts of annoyance and displeasure remain. And he says, and the end is happiness. The end is happiness and the absence of all of these thoughts. So peace is a good place to be at, but there's something even higher than that, and that is happiness. And there are people who they receive the divine decree of God, even difficult things, with joy, because they're not actually so focused on the difficult thing itself. They're focused on their Lord, and they have so much trust in him, so much love for him, so much contentment in him that they know that whatever they are experiencing, whatever they are witnessing is coming from him and it has to be good because he's good, because he's the greatest. So they, they kind of transcend the difficulty itself and that is truly a high level. And even at that high level, that highest level, he says, an initial reaction that lacks this virtue is forgiven in all cases for human nature is weak and no human being is entirely free of this. Okay, so meaning every human being, no matter how great their faith is, will experience a moment when the affliction first occurs, they don't like it. That's normal. So with all of the spiritual effort, what we can do is minimize that, but we can't actually eradicate it completely. And that's okay. And that's actually a sign of the human condition, alhamdulillah. Um, and it, and it's, uh, it shows, I would say it's a sign of God's mercy as well. So the person who has that highest level of contentment, then they have joy in their heart as destiny unfolds, right? They meet tribulations. It said they meet tribulations with a smile on their face. And that's, again, we, we mentioned these highest levels, not to make us despair or feel bad about ourselves, but to know that um, continuing in striving and practicing what we can practice has relief at the end. Um, there's reward, of course, in this life, but there's also uh, the, the, you know, that you keep going, you know, it's only going to get better. Don't give up in your patience. Don't give up in striving for contentment because uh, the levels only increase. And as the levels increase, things actually get easier. Spiritually, they get easier. So that's, I think, a very encouraging thing for all of us. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bestows a person with both the tribulation and the sakina at the same time, right? Without, they didn't do any spiritual effort in that particular test. The test hits and the person will say, I don't know why, but I've been at peace this entire time. And that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah grant us all gifts like that um, in difficult times. But it doesn't mean that if we are not granted that gift that there's nowhere for us to go. We're supposed to strive uh, towards patience. And this idea that if they are tested, they are patient, well, we're rewarded without measure when it comes to patience. 
our reward, uh, one of the reasons why a person may be um, not given the gift of sakina at the time of a great difficulty is Allah wants to give them great, great, great reward, right? He wants to elevate them. He wants to give them a higher station with him. And so that patience is where that immense and unimaginable reward comes from. If it was easy, right, then the reward would be a lot less. So sometimes when we see that difficulty in our lives, if we see ourselves in that difficulty having to practice patience, but also in that difficulty we are returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than we were before, then that's a really good sign. That is a blessing from God. That's Allah pulling you to himself through that tribulation. He's literally taking you from where you were and just making something to be a reason for your spiritual elevation. And, and that's from his kindness and that's from um, you know, his love and his mercy. So one of the things also that comes to mind when it comes to things we want versus things that happen is a beautiful statement of Ali radiallahu anhu, where he said, the only time that I'm happier than getting what I asked for is when I don't get what I asked for. So he makes a dua, and we know that our duas are answered in three ways. Either we get exactly what we ask for, or Allah saves our dua for the day of judgment, um, you know, and and he 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 gives us uh, on that day that that dua will be um, used in our favor, or um, the dua is used to block a calamity from befalling us or some other kind of harm from befalling us. So we don't get what we we say. The only time you don't get what you asked for is when you get better than what you asked for. So never stop asking because you're going to be getting regardless. So Ali Radlan, who in his, you know, supreme intellect and his um, understanding, he says, the only time I'm happier to not get what I ask for, or to, to happier um, than getting what I ask for is in not getting what I asked for, because that's a clear sign of God. I didn't get what I wanted. I got what God wanted. And that's so much better. And he would find happiness and joy in that. Um, and so this concept that someone's contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be so much that even as destiny unfolds with things that are difficult, they have joy in their hearts, again, because they believe deeply that everything that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khair. Uh, it's essentially good, and not just good, but it's the best. So I really want to emphasize this. As the destiny unfolds, we translate the word khair you know, um, as just good. But what it really means is best. So again, as Imam Ghazali has said, that nothing in the realm of possibility is better than what was. Okay, so it could never have been any better. Once it's happened, we know that was the best possible scenario. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just the one who knows everything that is. Right? He just, he, it's not that he knows just everything that exists and that will exist. He's also the one who knows the infinite possibilities of everything that does not exist. He knows the infinite possibilities of all that is not in existence. And what, so for something to happen and to occur and to exist is precise decision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his decision is the best. It's not just good, it's the best. It's better than what I could have chosen and what you could have chosen. And so we, through our good opinion of him, uh, and we we practice patience with things that are best, but we may they may be difficult. They may make us sad. They may be hard to overcome. There's a struggle involved. Maybe there's financial difficulty. Maybe there's emotional difficulty. And all of that is part of, you know, the, the life of this world in terms of where we get rewarded and how we're tested. But the knowledge, being, finding contentment with, I am content with Allah as my Lord, and I am content with his decree. And I will strive to have the, the best adab with what he decrees as possible, the best manners. And I want to increase my manners. You know, I want to always strive to be better with him. And one of the ways that we can do this is by keeping a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Ata'illah, he said, to soften for you the suffering of affliction, he has taught you that he is the one who causes trials to come to upon you. For the one who confronts you with his decrees of fate is the same one who has accustomed you to husn al ikhtiyar He's the same one who accustomed you to his excellent and best choice. 
one of the ways that we grow our patience, and it's a muscle that needs exercising, is uh, for us to be able um, to practice patience in the things that are easy, right? So in the acts of worship, uh, we, we practice this muscle of patience. In the acts of, um, uh, in staying away from things that are forbidden, then we also um, practice this uh, act of patience. Because of time, I have to move very quickly to the other two, which is that if they are given, they are thankful. Uh, alhamdulillah, this is very normal for people to, um, to be grateful when they have been given a blessing. It's, I should say it's it should be normal. It's, it's actually from our fitra to recognize that something that is there that we did not do ourselves was given to us by God. But also to know that all of our good, all of our good deeds, whatever we of good that we do, they're all blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to be truthful with Allah is to be grateful, to just be honest with him. And sometimes if a difficulty is kind of um, a hardship makes a person lose perspective, is take whatever that hardship is that seems to like cover your face and so you can't see anything else but the hardship and put it on a shelf and then look around and count all your blessings. And don't forget all the blessings you have while that hardship is right there. It's not going anywhere. It's sitting on a shelf. You will get to it <laughs> when the time comes. But actually to practice gratitude through a difficulty um, is also something that's really uh, significant for our faith. And then to practice gratitude in general for the things that are good. We have um, from this uh, a beautiful statement of Imam Junaid. He said that gratitude is that you do not use the gifts that Allah has given you to sin against him. So there's gratitude of the heart, which is to acknowledge and, and to look at the one who's, you know, the giver, the benefactor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to witness him as, your, as the one who's constantly giving to you. And there's gratitude of the tongue, which is to mention your blessings and to thank him for it. And the gratitude of the limbs is to use what we have been given in the way that Allah loves and to, and to be careful not to use our blessings in the way he doesn't love. So it wouldn't be grateful. It's not an act of gratitude to use your cell phone to look at things. A cell phone is an amazing piece of technology, right? It's an expensive piece of technology. There are people who cannot afford phones like this and they cannot connect to other human beings around the world. So from gratitude, that Allah has given you this piece of technology is to not use it to look at things that we shouldn't be looking at or to waste our, our time as much as we can possibly not waste our time on things that would take away our time, um, you know, without, without any benefit. And I'm not saying recreation is wrong um, or watching a cartoon or whatever it is that, you know, for, that's recreational that inshallah doesn't have harm in it. But the point is, is we, we strive to use the many gifts that we have um, whether it's your health or your strength or your time, uh, in ways that are um, in a, accordance with what Allah has uh, is, is pleased with. He's the one who gave it to us in the first place. And a different, you know, and a different, and I, I don't remember who said this, but it's a different person in our tradition who said that a higher level is that for, for some people, you know, this is the higher level of a spiritual level, is for some people when they are tested, they are grateful. And when they are given, they're generous. They just give it away. They have ithar with everyone else. They prefer other people over themselves. So that's a really high level that some people in our tradition had. Um, and then the last one is that when you are transgressed to actually forgive. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that a transgression that we have from another human being after it's occurred is also from the divine decree. We were meant to go through that hardship. We were meant to go through that difficulty. So the person in front of us Yes, they're sinful, and in front of Allah, they will be accountable. But ultimately, Allah has decreed for us to be faced with this test that another human being is harming us in some way. And so, um, the, especially when it comes to the light annoyances, this is like, I don't like the way this person looked at me. What, what did they mean when they said that? We can't be a people who get caught up in any of that. Um, we, I think in those types of situations, forgiveness should be a default setting in the Muslim where we overlook and we forgive each other and we don't hold grudges over silly things like that. That's a waste of time. It's also a sign that we're not using our time well. Um, but for bigger things that are heavier, that are abusive, right? Now that's a situation where forgiveness is not easy. And it may not be initially, but the idea is that the highest level of ihsan is to forgive. So it's not, a person can say, okay, I'm not there yet. 
and they're not even required to forgive according to the law. The Sharia does not require forgiveness. But it's one of those things that if you forgive, um, you're the one who benefits the most. You're the one who wins the most. You're the one in this life and the next who is who kind of like accumulates the most through this. And it's said that the great people in our tradition in Islamic history, it wasn't that they outdid everyone else in so many acts of worship. It was actually that they were harmed by people and um, they were subjects of slander. They were subjects of just all kinds of wrong things. And they had in their hearts a capacity for forgiveness and magnanimity. Um, and so through the harm that other people were harming them, their station was elevated because, you know, obviously that's a, that's a difficult when people are backbiting or doing whatever they're doing, the person who is the subject of that and they have done no wrong, they're, they're, they will automatically be elevated through that. And then for that person to turn around and then forgive the people who have harmed them, that's, that's incredible. And then again, their station is increased. So forgiveness is really, it's a spiritual aspiration. Right. So and it's a it's a it's something, you know, as Mujahid says, that where they're, when they're transgressed, they forgive. It's a sign of guidance. Like you actually know what this life is about and what the next life is about. Um, if you recognize the reality of the less of the of the afterlife, then forgiveness is something that even if you're not there today or tomorrow or even a year from now, you would it's something you have in your heart as an intention. I want to strive to be forgiving. And our communities can benefit from this. Um, we have on an individual, we can benefit from this. In, in community level, we can benefit from this. Uh, we have, there's, there's cities where institutions have 20 year old grudges. In, like organizations won't work together. They won't sit in the same room and have a conversation together. 20 year old grudges. And no one remembers what the fight was about. No one actually remembers what the problem was. Maybe a few people have a couple of stories, but the new generations have no idea what caused, like why, 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 why don't we do something together? Why are we not with each other? And um, and this is, you know, uh, this there's we can overcome this. So I would say that if you look at the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi also the Prophet Yusuf alaihi in a situation where someone has been harmed, it's important that that person who's been harmed is removed is fully removed from the harm. So they, they forgive from a place of being fully protected, safe, and secure, right? They're not still in a state of, ab of being abused. So the first thing is remove the person completely from abuse. Remove the person completely from harm. They have to be totally removed. And then they have to be elevated to, this, to the point where they have the upper hand. So in Fath Mecca, for example, the Prophet Muhammad SAW raised the largest army he had up until that point. It surrounded Mecca. And he had every right to exact revenge on the people of Mecca uh, who fought him and who killed his companions and who tried to attack the city of Medina where, 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 where civilian lives were and men, women, and children who were not part of the battlefield. They lived there. They tried to attack Medina, right? So he had every right. No one would have faulted him. No one would have faulted the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if, there, if uh, you know, the, the certain people were killed or punished at that time. But from when he had the position of strength, what he actually did was not only forgive, but he established, because now he has the upper hand, right? So the upper hand means I can, I have the ability to change the future in the situation. He established that city upon that which was right and good. Rather than hurt and harm, he guided them to that which was right. And he established them and made them firm on that which was good. That's what he did towards his enemies who fought him for years. Uh, the same thing happened with the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. They come to him, right? At, at this point, when he forgives them, he's the Amin, right? And he has full capacity to punish them, throw them in prison, do whatever he wants to them. And his command would have been obeyed. But instead, on that day, he forgives them, right? And what happens from that? He establishes them on good. He corrects them. And so that that's possible when a person is... Uh, fully removed from the situation and they have the upper hand and then they have they choose that highest level which is to forgive now what about the person who's still in harm they're still being harmed survival you have to protect yourself if you're still being harmed you have to protect yourself from that harm so finding a way out of that harm is in, is the immediate thing that needs to happen and um if there's if it's and you know harm is different things so depending on what we're talking about um 
a harm could be that um, someone uses your things at your office without permission and they um, they get it lost. They lose your things, they lose your stapler, they, they lose your, your pens, whatever it is. It could be something minor, <laughs> it could be something very big. But um, when a person is in harm, something that they can do when, especially with, when forgiveness does not even seem possible in that moment is, is to, um, is simply to make dua that Allah guides them to Tawbah, that Allah guides this person, makes them aware of their errors, guides them away from inflicting this harm, um, prevents them from doing this harm uh, to others. You can make dua for them to, to repent and to, um, to realize the error of their ways and to realize it in such a way where they would never harm anyone else. You can be the cause of someone else's uh, reform, even as you're being harmed by them and uh, by making dua for their guidance. And that doesn't mean that you stay in a state of harm. It's very important that a person removes themselves from harm always as much as they possibly can. But you can also make dua, this person, this person who is, had harmed me or is harming me, oh Allah, guide them. Guide them so they can stop doing this. Guide them so they can make tawbah in this life before they die. Guide them so that other people are not har harmed by them. And I want to say that accountability and forgiveness are not mutually exclusive. You can forgive someone and hold them accountable at the same time. So uh, I know because of time, we don't have time to get into this. But uh, one of the things that uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, he said, is he said, even if he has to carry out the head, you know, the hudud in Islamic law, they usually involve uh, the death penalty. Okay, so or they often can involve the death penalty. He said, even if I had to carry out the head, or I have to give someone the death penalty, my heart is careful to ra'i al-wud, that I'm going to be careful and watchful that I still love this person, right? Now that's, we're talking about very high stations, but what this, what this indicates to us is that it's part like justice and mercy are not mutually exclusive. Accountability, and love for someone and love for their well-being and love for that Allah would forgive them and love that Allah would uh, accept their tawbah and their repentance, they're not mutually exclusive. They can be together. Um, and we live in a time where we think justice has to be punitive. You have to hate the person. You have to want the worst for them. That all is in one box. Um, and then on the other side, there's another extreme, which is uh, no accountability, forgive them, let them do whatever they want, let them harm everyone, let them get away with everything. And that's another extreme that we're not talking about. We're actually talking about something that's together, where people are protected from harm, and your heart still wills good. It, you're, you're practicing a different muscle of patience now. It's It still wills good for the creation of God. Abu Yazid al-Bislami, he said a statement, I'll end with this. He said, I've been talking to Allah for 30 years and people think that I'm talking to, to them. I've been talking to Allah for 30 years and people think that I've been talking to them. So whatever comes up in the world for him, he simply sees it as different shades of God's divine decree. So the immediate uh, cause of this world is not what provokes his behavior. His heart is so connected and centered on God that he simply responds to everything and everyone um, as someone who is simply responding to God and talking to God. And so um, it, that's, that's, that's a really high level, obviously. Um, but in terms of wanting to start the new year with sort of refreshing the sense of guidance in our own hearts, we can do this again, inshallah, by refreshing our um, connection and our intention for patience right um our connection and our intention for gratitude and also uh our connection and our intention to be forgiving and to be and to be magnanimous inshallah and i don't have time to say more so we'll stop here inshallah and whatever was beneficial is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever is wrong and mistaken is from myself and shaitan Jazak Lohaid, thank you so much for that. I'm I this needs to be on a shirt, this statement. Focusing on their Lord transcends the difficulty. I wrote that down. That is focus on their Lord transcends the difficulty. SubhanAllah. You, you mentioned the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. You know, you, you mentioned the first stroke of calamity, right? Um, you know, at first that initial, like, I, I don't like it. 
right? And people may think like, that's so wrong, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, when he's thrown into the well, he's thinking, how could my own brothers do this? Will my father find me? Uh, um, how will I eat? But as soon as he he's at peace, right? you mentioned the, the second form of peace. As soon as he focuses on Allah, that's when the bucket comes to rescue him. That's when mm -hmm. Allah sends down the bucket. And you mentioned, you know, Allah knows the scenarios. If he didn't get thrown in the well, two things wouldn't have happened. He, if he didn't get thrown in the well, he wouldn't have been sold as a slave, put in prison wrongfully. He wouldn't have saved thousands of people when he became the director of agriculture. But not only that, you mentioned that forgiveness could be the cause of someone's reform. If, you know, he, forgiveness is very empowering, right? You, you're, in, you're in control of, of, of who is, you're in control of your emotions. Forgiving is very empowering. But when he forgives, it took two things, Saburun Jamil and forgiveness from Yusuf, Saburun Jamil from, from Yaqub, forgiveness from Yusuf, for all of those brothers to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Mm -hmm. And it could, take, it could take forgiving someone versus mm -hmm. saying, you know what, no, you know, you're going to prison, you're going blah, blah, blah. It could take that forgiveness, that mercy um, to, you know, subhanAllah, to, to change someone's life. And you mentioned this, and I, I'm going to pull into the, the chat for some questions. Um, you know, that that removing yourself in a, in a difficult situation. I, I've spoken with multiple domestic violence survivors, and I, I'm going to take it to this because I feel like we're all mature enough for the topic. The first thing that I say is, like, you have to remove yourself from it, is I'm just being patient. Can you touch a little bit about if you're at the form of, you know, uh, what even if it's not to that extent of you know you're being hurt and you view patience as just not doing anything or mm -hmm. let's say you're having a conflict with a colleague or maybe you're with your boss is just leaving things as is waiting for things to happen without doing anything is that a level of patience is that what we should do in patience so a patience is it's a the, the most important thing of patience is actually uh controlling ourselves so it's not, um, the results may not end up being what we want them to be, but controlling ourselves, meaning I have to control the state of my own heart, right? Um, and I want to respond to something in a way that is pleasing to God, right? So when it comes to, let's say you're in a situation of harm, right? Uh, yuzal, right? That's a qaida a fiqhia, that harm is to be removed. So um, it's not patience to continuously be harmed and not do anything about it. A person might think that's what patience is because it, patience in, in English sounds very, um, sounds very uh, passive. It's a very passive thing, right? That's why a lot of times it's translated as patient perseverance. Perseverance in, includes this like effort. Even Imam Ibn Ajiba, he says spiritual effort, like patience, you can't do it without this effort. So that now I have to do something that's not easy to do. Um, it is very difficult and it requires a lot of patience for someone who's in an abusive uh, marriage or there's domestic violence for that person to remove themselves completely from that environment. And so um, uh, it it's not an easy thing for someone to do. Many times they'll be in that situation and they'll doubt themselves and they uh, don't feel like they have the ability to, they don't feel like they have the power to, but they actually, in order to remove the harm that they're being afflicted with, they actually have to practice immense levels of patience uh, to get out. Just getting out is so hard. Um, and uh, we need community institutions that can help women when they're getting out so that they are safe and they're secure and their whereabouts are you know, protected. Um, it's not easy at all. So patience, Part of patience is removing the harm. It truly is about removing the harm. Jazakallah. Thank you so much, Barakalafiq. Um, just a few kind of <clears throat> comments. You know, this point was very well said. Reflections on point definitely gave me goosebumps. Um, we definitely are in the right place, alhamdulillah. A few questions that we have. There's one in the chat, in the private chat. If, if you're okay with answering it, just drop like a okay in the chat and I'll, we'll, we'll ask it. Um, but... Um, I'm gonna, uh, this question is um, a very common question that a lot of Muslims get. Um, why do we see so much suffering in the world, i.e. wars, etc.? 
um, a question that I think every is that Muslim or non-Muslim? Mm -hmm. Why? How could a God so merciful allow bad things to happen in this world? Yeah. I love your take on this, Bismillah. Yeah. Oh, well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There's entire vo volumes of books that have been written about this existential question from both Muslims and people of other faiths. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? And um, one of the things that we know is that, and this is really, really, really important for us to know this, is that um, this life was not created to be our paradise. Um, this life was created as a test, literally as a test. That to test which of which uh, of us are best in our responses and in our deeds, and one of the secrets of tribulation is that it's a form of purification as well. Like someone who's going through hardship, their sins are purified, just because they went through that hardships and they kept their faith in Allah through that hardship. That you don't even get a pinprick, except that you lose bad deeds from it, right? So, um, so imagine like much more than that that purifies us. And then there's elevation, right? So that a person can walk around this earth and they're being tested and there's and there's in so much tribulation that they're spiritually, even without doing a whole lot of worship, they have a very high rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and so this is one of the secrets you could say of tribulation that for the believer, right? The, the Prophet Muhammad he said that wondrous is the affair of the believer when something difficult happens when they're tested, they're patient and they're rewarded and when something good happens to them that they like, when they're given, they're grateful and they're rewarded. So like you have the reward for gratitude and you also have the reward for patience. And this is only, he said, this is only for the believer. When something bad happens, he says, don't say, don't say if only, because if is from the shaitan. Uh, this idea of if, if only this could have happened, if only that could have happened, if only this could have gone my way. Um, Iman or faith is to believe that nothing that I could think of going a certain way um, is better than what God has chosen to occur. Now, does that mean that everything that occurs is something that is pleasing to God in the sense that it's going to be rewarded? No, wars happen, right? Uh, terrible things like the Holocaust happens, entire genocides ha happen. And these are tribulations in the world, right? They are, they're afflictions. Um, and yet, because this is not the this is the beginning of our lives. This is not the end of our lives. You could say this is not even all of our lives are not more than a morning or an afternoon. And all of the life of this world is not more than a morning or afternoon. That's how we will remember it in the next life. It was it was just like a morning. The whole thing was just like a morning or an afternoon. But there's the life to come, which is the eternal life, which is the true life. And, and that's what uh, a lot of the affliction that's going to happen in this morning or afternoon, the payout and the reward and the and the true bliss that is meant for those who have gone through these things and they maintain their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their hard times, that's really when they're going to celebrate. And in the next life, for the believers, anyone who maintained their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, they, they died on Iman then in the next life, it's actually going to be the most difficult, painful, suffering moments of this life that are gonna be their favorite, most beloved to them in the next world because they're gonna say, it's that test, it's that tribulation I went through, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that, he gave me this high station and this high place in paradise. No one in paradise will regret the hard times of this life. They're actually gonna be, they're gonna say, thank God I went through that because it was through that that I, uh, that I came here. I was able to attain this place that's close to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or in the highest levels. So tribulation is, some of the scholars, they say tribulation is all good. It's all good. It doesn't feel good, but it's all good. Um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the, for the believer, this life feels like a prison, right? But the next life is not like that at all. Um, and so, it's kind of like if someone is reading a book and they only read the first page of the book, they can't make a judgment on the entire book. They haven't even read the rest of the book. And all of this life, you could say, is like the first page of a book, of our own books. And the rest of it is we will discover, inshallah, after we pass away with a life that happens in the barzakh, the life of the grave, which is its own life that happens until, and, you know, and how we lived in this life and what we went through in this life is, will affect 
our condition in the barzakh and then the afterlife itself. So, um, so yeah, uh, I would say that tribulation and difficulty, people will be held accountable for, for, their, for, their, for the wars, right? People are gonna be held accountable for the injustices. People will be held accountable in the Supreme Court of Justice that can never occur in this world. Absolute justice is just absolutely impossible in the life of this world. But there is a, a time and a place where that justice uh, is inescapable no one would be able to escape it. And so, um, you know, you could say the records are set straight at that time and um, no one gets away with it. Maybe someone, their whole first page of the book, they hurt people, right? All they did was get away with things and hurt people and create war and create destruction on this earth. And the rest of their book is punishment, right? So someone else, the first page of their book is difficulty and tribulation. And the rest of their book is bliss. So, wallahu a'ala. Jazakallah khair. And, you know, you, you, you touched on this saying, you know, patience is, it's it's a muscle that needs to be exercised. And, you know, Allah saying in the Quran that he won't put more on a soul that it can bear. You know, when you go to, when, when, when somebody works out and goes to the gym, they don't lift so much that they can't even lift it. They lift just enough so their muscle can get stronger each and every time. Allah knows your, your, your capacity and he gives you just enough to exercise that that muscle, uh, that spiritual muscle. And you know, if the world was free of problems, paradise would lose its value. Bad things happen around the world to see what are we gonna do to step up. That's how we get our good deeds, right? If there are no poor people in the world, who would we donate? Who how would we help and you know feel fulfilled by by helping, subhanAllah. Um this is well, well one thing I would just also wanted to add in this because people say this all the time is Allah only tests you uh with what you can bear. Yeah. Um, there's a in the tafsir of that verse in the Quran. Um, it, it, one of the comments, I think it's from the tafsir of Mamar Razi, I could be mistaken. It says that um, Allah only holds us accountable in a test in accordance with our actual capacity. Hmm. So we are not account, we don't have taklif right in front of God except for that which was in our capacity. So we could actually experience a test that's greater than our capacity, it's greater than we can bear. We can experience a test and go crazy, literally lose our minds. But Allah does not hold us accountable except in accordance to the part to the, to our capacity. Uh, so whatever aspect of that test was within our capacity, that's where our accountability is. And whatever aspect of that test was beyond our capacity, and we acted sort of outside of what Allah wanted from us, but it was also outside our actual capacity, then He does not hold us accountable for that. And I think that's a really important thing for us to like just know is that we have a loving, just Lord. He's not going to hold us accountable for something that we actually could not bear. He may test, he may actually, something may fall upon us that actually is beyond us. And that has happened. There are people who like lose their faculties um, completely, their mental faculties completely, um, or even temporarily. And Allah is the one who knows that better than we do. Jazakallah khair for, for adding that. We, we have a few minutes left, but we have a few, little bit few questions um is, i don't know if we can take one or two or if we can do like a rapid fire um there's a lot of good questions um okay bismillah how do we how do we know if a trial is because of our sin or a test from allah so i i remember one thing that i've heard different answers to the same question by the way i've heard different shuh answer it in a different way the one that i feel spiritually has been of most benefit for myself is something I heard from um, Sheikh Walid Musad that this idea again is um, to have a good opinion of Allah. I am as my servant thinks I am, and so in general, I don't um, I don't uh, analyze tests very much in terms of is it because of X Y Z. What I will assume from a test is Allah always wants good for me from this test. And so if, um, so he says, and something Sheikh Walid mentions, he says that if you look at a test and you say, this is purification from sin and elevation, inshallah, then you will experience this, that experience that test as purification and elevation. But if you have a test and you look at that test and say, oh, this is the punishment of God, then you will experience that test as a punishment from God. And may Allah protect us from that. I don't think we should think about a test as being punishment. I think we should think about our tests as being anything difficult that we're going through as purification 
and elevation, purification, elevation. And inshallah, you experience it in that way and you maintain a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that way. And you experience the purification as, um, you know, uh, as from sin, as, you know, a chance to do better, a chance to get better, not, um, you know, you don't experience it as adab, which is just uh, punishment. I reserve, you know, I, I would say like it's, I would, for us in our relationship with Allah, let's reserve the designation of adab, inshallah, for, for the akhirah. Um, but in this life, while we believe in him and while we're striving in his way to look at our difficulties as purification and elevation, inshallah. Inshallah, jazakallah khair. Let's let's do one more question, inshallah. Um, don't mind this dude over here. He's just um, doing whatever. Uh, anyways, um, what would you say is the fine line between um, having complete tawakkul while also tying the camel? Does complete tawakkul mean that you don't tie the camel and do the work needed? So the Prophet Muhammad's command is to tie the camel, right? So but tying the camel and thinking because I tied the camel, because I did X, Y, Z, now God is going to give me X, Y, Z. Don't make those kinds of equations. Meaning you may be tying a camel in one area and Allah will give you your risk from somewhere completely different that you had not intended. And so taking the means is just, you, we take the means as an act of obedience to Allah, right? So um, we take them, we, we, we quote unquote do what we can because God has asked us to do that. But tawakkul is like, my need will actually be fulfilled by God, not necessarily by the means I'm taking. It could happen by the means I'm taking. It could not happen by the means I'm taking. So um, I often say this is two people can take the same medicine, right? The medicine doesn't cure us, right? And the medicine can work for one person and that person has shifa and is cured. And then the medicine may not work for someone else. And um, the other person doesn't have, doesn't have is not cured, or is not alleviated from that. So the actual healer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're, we're, we're told to take the medicine and that for every disease, there is a cure. So what does that also mean? It means that we would seek the cure. We would seek medicines out. Um, but again, it's through, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who, who would allow something to work um, that we take. And nothing has power in and of itself. All of the power to affect our situation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. I, I want to respect your time. I'll do the announcements very fast. Do you think we can do one more question? Sure. Sure. That's fine. Okay. So um, there's two questions that we're not going to be able to get to. I'm extremely sorry for, for the viewers on that. But um, for this question, uh, uh, how can we practice patience when dealing with sins, habits that we find difficult to overcome? And when we sin, sometimes we feel constricted and unworthy of returning to Allah to the extent that a sin feels like a punishment. How can we maintain patience in constantly returning? Okay, so can you go back to the first part of the question? Let's do the first part first. Yes, so, um, subhanAllah, one of the things that is mentioned in the patience, Imam Ibn Ajiba mentions it, other scholars mention it, is the first patience that believers practice is the patience to do the good deeds, <laughs> right? To practice it and 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 uh, and remove the harm, remove the bad deeds or the sins that were the, the things that we're supposed to avoid. So we we all seek to increase the the good in terms of our acts of worship and good deeds that we do, and and to eliminate anything that's bad. And that muscle that needs to be practiced for all of us in in our deeds. You know, um, we have to have patience with ourselves. And that's a, that's a really hard thing to do. As someone, I can tell you, it's not easy. I relate to the question in the sense of not being patient with myself sometimes and um, wanting something before it's time, right? So like, I want to be doing better in these kinds of ways, right? Um, through these kinds of deeds. And I'm not getting there with these kinds of deeds that I want to get to, right? So then you lose patience with yourself. Um, and so, uh, and get frustrated with yourself. So I wanna say that that's normal just for the sister who asked and um, we go through that. Uh, and so so just, just recognizing that. Um, when he says like spiritual effort and spiritual striving, the thing that I have found myself to be the most effective um, is in, in terms, even in terms of like the, the practice of patience is to identify thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, 
we have thoughts, we have negative thoughts. And these negative thoughts um, can be, we have to look at where it's coming from and what the message is and what the end goal is. So if the, mes if the negative thought is, uh, I call it the three Ds. The first is despair, right? I'm never going to get better. I, what's the use? Why should I keep trying? I've tried a thousand times. I can't do this, right? Those thoughts, that despair, that is the voice of shaitan. Okay, that's waswas. We have to reject waswas, otherwise it becomes part of our nafs, and then our nafs will repeat it to us, even if shaitan walks away. <laughs> but the ultimate source of that is shaitan, right? This, these, this, these voices of despair. Then second negative thought that we have to look at is that which calls for destruction, destroy something. Um, you're upset, you know, this, you, you, this destructive impulse, right? It could be uh, organizationally, you're working and you're like, I'm just gonna, you know, whatever, cause a huge problem, God protect us all. Um, it could be in any, like it's an impulse that shows up on a, on a community-wide level. We t When we speak, we give away sometimes what the voice that's been speaking to us. So if you've attended like a town hall meeting or a city community meeting that there's a problem and people start to talk, they will articulate in speech the impulse that's actually going through them. So some person will stand up and what they don't realize, like what you're actually, what you actually want right now is to destroy everything. You want to destroy the organization. You want to destroy the message. You're not seeking to improve or build. You just want to destroy. So that's the voice that you're listening to, and that's the voice that you're now articulating. Okay, so that, so just know that that's a that's a that's a second D of shaitan. The third D is distraction. So if he can't get you to despair and he can't get you to destroy then let me at least distract them from doing as much good as they could be doing or um, and, and waste their time. And so um, everything, they're curious about all sorts of things and it's, it keeps them unfocused and able to do anything. So if you can identify the thought, in your case, it sounds like it's despair. There is literally like this thing where you um, acknowledge that this is actually from Shaitan and his intention is to stop you from, from doing what you can do. And uh, you have to sort of rewrite the thought. Okay, and I'm going to take the waswas and I'm going to rewrite the thought, which is um, everything is easy for Allah. <laughs> everything is easy for Allah. I may be weak, but Allah is the most powerful and He's the most strong, right? And if I put my trust in Him, He's I'm going to put I'm going to rely on Him to help me do better. I'm not going to rely on me because I don't have any strength or power of my own. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take away this despairing thought. I'm gonna rewrite it with dhikr, and you could repeat maybe la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And you really feel that your strength and power is gonna come from God. You put your trust in your strength that you get from God, and then you try again. But now you're trying again, not with your negative thoughts. You're trying again with God. You're with Him. So now you're gonna try, and you're gonna say, Oh Allah, please, and again with dua, Oh Allah, please help me to do better this time. Help me to do this and receive your gift from God. Like receive your prayer from God, receive your good deeds from God. Don't see yourself as the agent doer. See yourself as the one who's receiving it from him. And inshallah, or try to, inshallah, maybe we all try to do that. And um, you know, I, I take too long when I answer the questions. I know there was a second part and I don't remember what it was. No, no worries. That that, that was, it. It was kind of the first and the second question kind of overlapped and you hit it. And Jazakallah Khaid, thank you so much for your time, for those reflections, those gems. Uh, if we can get like a bunch of like roses and like claps and all those like emo fun emojis in the chat for Sheikh Muslima, uh, mashallah for that answer. We got the we got one of those things, and Jazakallah Khair for the beautiful answer. May Allah grant us that level of thinking. Um, and I Jazakallah Khair, greatly appreciate you. There are a couple questions that we didn't get to, unfortunately. Um, but I want to say thank you to everyone that, that that's out there. And Jazakul Khair, may Allah bless you, Sheikh Muslima, for 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 jumping on and spending these gems. Uh, there we go. There's the roses. There we go. We got them now. Alhamdulillah. So, thank you so much. Barakallahu fikum. An honor. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.